Brother Brinks. And if, you know, I know some of you, I, I saw the registration list, but I live in Spokane, Washington. I'm an outdoor writer, uh, a tournament angler. Um, I do a lot of things in the fishing industry um, and really just fish quite a bit. You know, I'm, I'm the president and uh, co-founder of the Spokane Bass Club, um, two-time BFL ang um, Angler of the Year, two-time Washington State team member. And I've lived in a few different states. I've lived in Florida and Nevada, and I really am very passionate about the bass fishing that we have here. I, I believe it's some of the best in the country. I mean, it's a it's very good. If, if you're from this area, you're, you're lucky. Um, and you know the things that we're going to cover tonight. It's going to be mostly the Pacific Northwest, but it's very similar to you know the Midwest. Um, you know even even the Northeast. I mean a lot of the natural lakes are going to be are going to fish kind of similar, especially during the summer. Uh, a couple quick things. Um, anytime you have questions, just feel free to um, send them off. I'll see them when they come through. You know if it's something that I see and it's relevant to what I'm talking about right then, we'll do it right then. If not, we'll answer questions all the way at the end. Um, it will be recorded, that's another thing. And it will also be um, put on YouTube for the Navionics YouTube page and then also my YouTube page. Um, so we'll, we'll get that up you know, the next day or so. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and get started here with a quick poll and we'll just go ahead and uh, do that and kind of see where you guys live. Good to know, again, the question is what state do you live in? It's either Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana or other. There's quite a few others, which is good. And like I said, there there's gonna be a lot of things specifically about Northwest Lakes, but it's going to apply to a lot of places that, that are very similar. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Like I said, summer bass fishing in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, it looks like it's it's up. Okay, so we're going to go over the agenda real quick. You know, we're going to kind of talk about my summer approach, you know, bait selection, locations i mean because that's one of the most important things in all of fishing you have to be in the right spot i mean it doesn't baits matter but location i think is even more important um, i'm going to talk about night fishing something i like doing quite a bit um, talk about fish care you know this is the time of year when fish are more susceptible to to dying from the the hot weather and being caught deep so i'll just go over a quick um, few tips that i have for that and then we'll, we'll get into the q a Okay, um, so in the summer, you know, the, the biggest thing for me is to find some type of current. You know, if it's, it's pretty easy if you're on a river system or a lake that has creeks flowing into it. But, you know, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is there's current all the time from waves and, you know, boat wakes. I mean, all those things do the same thing that current does, um, you know, like a natural stream or river. So, you know, finding those activity, those areas where there's tons of wake borders and things like that, you know, Typically, bass fishermen hate that. You know, they they hate seeing all these pleasure boaters going all over the place. But I found that that really helps a lot of times, especially if it's really hot out or if it's there's no wind at all. You know, that kind of stuff really stirs up the fish, stirs up the bait fish, and then gets the bass aggressive. So, you know, those wake borders may be helping you out a little bit. You know, obviously they they are kind of annoying at times, but you know, it definitely helps. You know, in a popular populated area. And, you know, my theory on that, you know, those, those fish that live in that area that are used to a lot of boat traffic, you know, around boat ramps and around parks and things like that, I think they get used to the boats constantly going through um, and they kind of use that to an advantage or to their advantage. So that's kind of my theory on it. But, you know, finding current is, is key, like whether it's what you think of as current or wind or, or something else. <laughs> um, you know, the other thing that is always a good thing to do in the summer is to find humps and islands. I um, mean, you can do that with help of, of mapping, you know, Google Earth. There's a lot of ways to find those those offshore spots. Um, points are also very good in the summer. Um, really, they're they're good all the time, but especially in the summer for me. And then grass, you know, grass is is huge in the summer. You know, well, really, most of the time, it's you know, it's obviously going to be the most grass during the summer, but it's a, it's a great thing to key on. Um, you know, my theory and my my approach is shallow in the morning, and then you know, head out deeper in in the afternoon. You know, that's kind of how I approach it, um, but it, it can be different. Um, shade if is if staying shallow and docks, and we're going to talk about all those things. All right, so like I said, current is, is very big during the summer. So if you could find it and there's not current everywhere, um, you know, those, those areas you're going to find fish, you know, because like I was saying earlier, it stirs up the bait fish, it's cooler water. Everything about current is good during the summer. Um, it's definitely one of the first things I look for anywhere I go. 
No, when there's current, you know, th this is kind of my approach and, and the baits that I, I use most. You know, typically I'm gonna use a, a faster moving bait first, you know, crank bait, spinner bait. I actually put spinner baits on there twice. That's supposed to be swim baits. Um, those are the, the three things that I use quite a bit if I'm if I'm fishing fast, you know, tubes and jigs, drop shots another good one, you know, but you you might get hung up quite a bit. So that's kind of goes back to why I like those those fast moving baits. If there's a lot of rocks, you're not going to hang up as much. Now, um, I said always cast upstream, and I, I put the, the quotes on it because it's it's not always true. But in my experience, you always want to be casting upstream and letting the bait come back down naturally. You know, I see a lot of people that are going downstream with the current. You know, I'm sure they're, they're, they'll catch a fish or two, but my experience is it's better to be casting upstream at all time. No matter how fast the current is, no matter how much of a pain it is, that boat positioning is so important. You know, you, you want to be facing the current and going into the current and casting up. And if it's fast current, just turn a controlling motor because, again, that's what the fish are used to, and that's the way they're positioning themselves is looking upstream for something to flow by them. So you can go downstream with the current if you want, but um, I think you're just going to have a lot better luck going um, facing into the current. Okay, so again, guys, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to just uh, send them off. Oh, hold on a second here. Okay, sorry about that. But yeah, if you have any questions, just let me know and we'll um, we'll get to them. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, you know that's kind of my approach for current. So humps and islands, you know, I, they always attract, especially during the summer. And, you know, looking at different tools, they're, they're pretty easy to find. You know, this is a map of um, Banks Lake, which is in Washington State. And you can see this hump comes up quite a bit. You know, everything around it's, you know, 40, 40 feet and it's 20 feet up on top. So this is a, a very good hump. Um, you know, I just kind of looked at it. I have fished this hump and um, there are fish summer and winter. This is a great spot to catch them. Okay, you know, when it comes to bait selection, you know, one of my first things that I pick up is a deep crankbait. Um, football heads is another one. You know, either it's going to be a, a hula grub on a, you know, like a half ounce football head or a skirted football head, you know, more of a traditional football head. Um, you know, top water as well, if it's, if it's shallow enough. And I would say less than about 10 feet or so, I'll still be using top water. Um, you know, it, they will come up from deeper than that, but that's kind of my, my rule of thumb. Um, and then drop shot, of course. And, you know, I'm going to kind of go over a few things with drop shot. You know, this is taken from my um, drop shot presentation that we did earlier in the year. You know, and I get a lot of questions about this. And it's about the equipment that I use, the rods, reels, baits. So we're going to just go over that real quick. And, uh, you know, maybe it's, it's something you haven't tried and it may help you out wherever you live. Okay, so, you know, when I'm selecting a drop shot rod and reel, you know, the thing that I always look for with the drop shot rod is the length and the action. You know, any good spinning rod will, will work for a drop shot. You know, even bait casting will work. Um, but I prefer a rod that's seven foot or longer just to get a little bit longer cast. And then when it comes to action, I, I'm a person that uses a lot lighter action than a lot of people. I always go with a medium light, you know, and that allows me to, um, I feel cast it further, um, feel more bites, um, just everything, play big fish on light line, there's there's a lot of benefits to that medium light action. And then sensitivity, you know, you, obviously you wanna be able to feel the bite, so get the most sensitive rod that you can. Um, keys to a good drop shot reel, you know, number one being good drag, you know, like I was talking about with that action of that, that rod, you wanna have, um, if you're playing big fish on light line, you gotta have good drag. Um, and not too big, you know, or not too small. So if you're a Shimano person, you know, a 2,500 size is what I use. And then if you're using something like an Abu Garcia, which is another one I use, you know, it's going to be a 20 or 30 size. Those are the, the best sizes that I use for drop shot fishing. And they, they give you plenty of lines so you can make really long casts. You know, they really hold a lot of that light braid. So you're, you're good to go. You know, obviously you want a smooth retrieve, but really just get whatever you can afford. You know, if it's a $75 reel or if it's a $475 reel, you know, just get whatever you can afford that has all these characteristics and you'll be able to, you know, do well with drop shot fishing because it's, it's crucial for summertime fishing. I think every slide that I'm going to show you is, 
as drop shot mentioned somewhere because it works excellent during the summertime. So rod and reel, these are two of my rod and reel setups. I got the Abu Garcia Villain 2.0. This is seven foot medium light. And then this is um, an Abu Garcia Revo MGX size 20. Um, and then this is a Phoenix Ultra MBX, again, seven foot medium light. And then this is a Fluger. Um, this is a Fluger Patriarch, I believe is what it's called. Um, excellent reels, both of them fit what I was talking about. And you know, these do the majority of my drop shot fishing. Uh, work you know I, I have several drop shot rods because i use it all the time um, but these are two that i use quite a bit and um you know just 20 pound braid and you know some people think that's really heavy but the cigar smackdown which is what this is is very very thin you know you're talking like a six pound diameter so you can go with a heavier line and then i join it with a um eight pound cigar tatsu fluorocarbon and that is going to be combined with what I found to be the best braid to fluorocarbon knot and that's the modified Albright. Um, some people call it the crazy Alberto. Uh, you know I'm not really sure which is the correct one but if you search for both of those you should be able to find it. You know go on YouTube. Um, this is a quick diagram. You know basically you just wrap it down six times. This is seven and then back up the same way seven or six. There's a lot of um variants on on the the magic number of, of wraps but definitely check out some youtube videos on how to tie this knot because it, it's awesome it works very good and it's i found it to be a lot easier and faster than, to tie than than just about any other one that i've seen okay. all right we're gonna um see if you guys have any more questions One second, bear with me here. Okay, cool. We're gonna um, stop here real quick. Uh, I got a question. Okay, and again, just, this is a good time. If you have some, just just shoot them off, and we'll uh, we'll get to them. Okay, uh, Neil asks, you know, small lake, no current in eastern Washington. Um, deep drops, you know, six to 15 feet, you know, with Thule's cattails, use Senko's some success in low light, but what I found during the middle of the day, or but what about during the middle of the day? And um, he said he's having very little success with good size largemouth. You know, it's gonna kind of depend on this, if there's any grass, and if it if there is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a few things about grass fishing here coming up. Um, but another good thing, and we'll talk about this too, but it's a topwater bait, in the middle of the day and you know a lot of people just only throw it in the first light or right before it gets dark but i found that it catches big fish in the middle of the day for some reason i don't know if people aren't throwing it but it's a great way to catch big ones you know something like a big super spook uh, that might be a good option for you you know you're definitely not going to catch as many little tiny ones as you would with other baits so i mean i would definitely try a a, a um a super spook or a big topwater bait like that but if there is grass, the, the, the slides that we're gonna go over here coming up, I think will definitely help you out. Okay, good question. And Neil, feel free to um, you know, send me an email and in any of you guys, it's tbrinks at navionics.com and maybe tell me what lake it is and I might be able to, maybe I fished it or something. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and go back to this one. Okay. Okay, so like I said, this is a great knot. It's awesome, so definitely check that out. I used to tie the double uni, and it, it's a great knot. I've never broke any fish off, but I found that you'll actually break off when you hang up, whereas this one you won't. You know, if you get hung up in a rock or something, this one your, your, leader, your leader will break before the knot does, which I think is the ultimate goal. So definitely check this one out. Okay, um, just quick thing on some drop shot baits, and we'll talk about some of the uh, different baits as well, then we'll get into some of my other favorite techniques during the summer. Um, you know, this is always a topic. There's a lot of drop shot weights on the market, a lot of styles, you know, round, um, the cylinder, the teardrop right here, you know, there's tungsten. You know, I, I found that um, really I don't use the round very much anymore. You know, they are good. You know, they're pretty easily to, easy to find, but, you know, they really hang up quite a bit on grass. Um, they, they do work good in sand. Um, the teardrop is, is an excellent choice for grass and rock. 
Um, the cylinder is another one that works very, very well. And this one will actually, um, will hang up quite a bit if, if the rocks are small, but I, I found that most of the time I'm using a cylinder and um, teardrop as well. And then there's tungsten as well. You know, if, if you're fishing somewhere where there's not a lot of rock and, um, you know, maybe you're fishing pretty shallow, tungsten might be a better option for you. So that's just a quick um, overview on the, the drop shot weights. Okay, um, drop shot baits, you know, as you can see, there's a ton of them. You know, uh, use a lot of robo worms, um, either the straight tail, the sculpin, the rain's bubbling shaker, a lot of Biovex baits, Berkeley baits, Kitech. I mean, there's the kind of the point of all this is there's no wrong answer for what you're going to use on a drop shot. You know, the only thing I, I always tell people is not to have a curly tail worm because your line's going to twist quite a bit. Um, you can do it, but I've just, it's more hassle than it's worth for me. Now here's a few of them that I was talking about. This is a Kitech Easy Shiner, uh, the Powerbait Twitch Tail Minnow, um, Kitech 6 Impact, Havoc Moneymaker, and then a good old Robo Worm. All these are awesome during the summer. Uh, there's one. This is a bait that um, the Biovex Colt Fishtail. Um, this one works very, very good too. Okay, so moving along to my other favorite thing to do during the summer, and that's cranking. And the reason I like cranking is it is one of the best ways to cover water. And sometimes during the summer up here, you, you need to be covering water because the fish may be only in certain areas. So really all the time, cranking does that for you. You know, you can fish as, as deep as you want, you know, relatively, you can fish down to 30 feet, um, super shallow to very deep. You know, and I found that this is probably the best way to catch a big one during the summer. And, you know, going back to your, your question, Neil, you know, cranking might be another option for you as well. You know, there's a lot of um, small cranks that, that can get deep, and I'll show you a couple of those that I use, especially this time of year up here. Okay, so this is, uh, first going to a little bit deeper, this is a, it's called a um, Ima Beast Hunter, and this one gets down to about 13, 14 feet, but this is a good mid-range crankbait, and that's a very good color for up here. It's actually taken at uh, Newman Lake, if you guys are from around here, and it works very good. Um, it, you can see there's some teeth marks on it and this is the first day I tried it. So when it comes to those shallow cranks that get deep, like I was talking about, um, these are, this is a Strike King 3XD and I believe this is a 5XD, but this 3XD especially works very good during the summer, especially late in the summer around, uh, the Pacific Northwest. For some reason that small, small profile that can get down to 10 feet is excellent. I, I do fish it on this 10 pound line. Um, this is in Vizx, so it can get down there a lot quicker with that lighter diameter. You know, that's something that a lot of people don't um, maybe pay attention to as much, but the line diameter and the pound test makes a huge difference in how deep your crankbait can get. But late in the summer, this 3XD is hard to beat. Okay, so the other um, big point of, yeah, not, not really, didn't mean that one, but uh, point of, uh, location is, is actually points. So, you know, this is at Banks Lake in Washington State, and this is an area that you guys might be familiar with, but, you know, the great thing that I, I see here is there's lots of points. So if you find a certain point that's working, you're able to jump from point to point to point, and you could do that, and once you find what depth the fish are on, you know, what bait they want, you can really replicate it very quickly, especially if the lake has a lot of points. So points are one of the best things to look for during the summer really anywhere and it could be rocky points like this it could be um, round shallow points that just get a little bit deeper I and mean, there's a lot of um, variation depending on what type of lake you're fishing but any type of point is going to be a, a good thing to start and a lot of people fish them but a lot of fish are there so you know you kind of have the percentage gain there's going to be just about everybody jumping on those points but there's going to be a lot of fish in those areas Okay, when it comes to bait selection, you know, it's pretty similar to, um, you know, what I've kind of already talked about. You know, there's really not too many secrets out there, um, but, you know, these are the ones that I reach for first. You know, crankbaits, you know, those football heads with hula grubs, drop shot, of course, jigs, um, you know, like I was either a skirted football head or just a standard casting jig. You know, they work great on points. And then top water, that's an excellent choice. Um, so here you go. This is what happens when you fish points, and um, this is about 30 feet of water on a football head. So there's there's big ones. It doesn't have to be um, um, only 
you know, little ones. I mean, there, there's big fish out deep in 30 feet of water in the summer. This was, I believe, in August up here. Okay, moving along, I'm going to talk about grass. And, you know, I love fishing grass. Like I said earlier, I, I lived in Florida, so I learned a lot about it. And my first choice, that's why I have this picture of my frog box, is it's going to be frogs. You know, if there's grass of any type, you know, if it's lily pads or um, milfoil or anything, or even some kind of just trash blown together that, you know, chopped up grass, frog is going to be an awesome choice, especially those, um, those shallow grassy lakes. So frogs, like I said, number one. You know, and punching, again, I, I put this in quotes because, you know, there's not major punching like there is in other parts of the country, but you can still do it. You know, there's not too many places where you need like a two ounce weight with a small soft plastic like a beaver or something like that. But a, a one ounce um, will pretty much cover everything you're going to see in, in the Pacific Northwest and lakes like it. Um, you know, one other approach that I always do is pitching deep weed lines or pad lines. Um, you know, those are pretty easy to find you know pad lines are, are very vis visual so you could see them just head out to the deeper side of them the deepest water you can and start pitching the deep pad lines um you know they don't grow as deep so you're, you're looking at probably five to ten feet at the max is, is where you're going to be on the outside of them deep weed lines are going to be a little bit deeper um you know they can be deeper you know down to 20 feet or so but you can still pitch those even though there's not something to the surface even though they're down 15 or 20 feet you can still pitch to the edges of them you know with jigs and texas rig worms and things like that um, you know the other top bait selections um choices for grass is spinner baits and swim baits you know i like to throw spinner baits where um you know just a standard double willow chartreuse and white you know anything that looks like a bluegill anything like that will work Swim baits, and you know, typically I'm talking about the hollow belly style, you know, something like a, a Berkeley hollow belly or a Strike King Shadowlicious, you know, five inch I found to be just about perfect size for um, both getting a lot of bites and catching fish. Because if you throw the, the six inch or seven inch, you're not gonna get as many bites, you may get a few bigger ones, but you, you know, you're not gonna catch as many. Whereas, like, you going down to like a four inch. You know, you might catch a lot, but they're going to be a lot smaller. So I've found that five inches is, is, is the perfect size for me, at least. Okay, um, we're going to talk about a couple frog modifications real quick. I got one of my frogs here. It's the one seen in the picture. So as you can see from this one, it's the same frog. This is a snag-proof um, Ish's fat frog. And you can see I trimmed the legs kind of crazy on, um, you know, first I trim them shorter, and then I make one side smaller than the other and this is going to allow it to walk side to side a lot better so that's one thing you can do um, to make it walk a lot better and you can get a little bit different action than just popping it on the surface so that's a great trick to, to do um, pretty easy to do just trim it and um, you know start a little bit longer and, and find the, the right length for you um, you know this kind of reminded me I just I wrote an article on this in the last couple weeks and you know the, the five things that I do to, to modify the frogs you know trim your legs Add some noise, you, know, you can add a rattle inside of it or even a, a craft bell. You know, that's a, a great way to add some more noise because a lot of times when they're coming through the grass, they just kind of miss it. You know, if you fished a frog long enough, you know that that happens. So that's a, a great way to help them zone in on it a little bit better. You know, also upgrading and changing your hooks. You know, some of them, you know, they, the hooks get dull really quick or they are just cheap hooks. So you can get a, a hook from um, Gamagatsu, the double EWG frog hook. It's pretty easy to change, um, so just kind of play around with that. You just pull the hook out. There's a little ring there connecting the line tie and the hook, and swap it out. You could also add a trailer hook. There's actually ones on the market for frogs, so you get a few more of those bites. And then uh, another thing I do quite a bit is is changing the color. You know, either using a marker to tone it down a little bit. If it's you know bright yellow underbelly, and you know you want to kind of tone it down a little bit, you can add some stripes. You can just marker it up and you know, rubbing alcohol will actually pull some of that off. So it's not a permanent thing. All right, so let's see if we got any other questions here. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Got some more questions, okay. 
All right, so I'm uh, used to fish in California lakes like Oroville, which is a steep um, sided canyon reservoir and tends to be very deep. I'd like to know if the topography is similar to the Washington lakes using your in your examples. You know, um, that this, the lake I showed with the points, uh, Banks Lake, it's very similar, you know, because it's, it's deep rocky areas. You know, I haven't fished Oroville, but I fished Shasta, but I know that they have a lot of points. And um, I'd say that's probably the closest to it. So a lot of these, um, you know, I'm talking about the points and things like that. Yeah, it's, it's going to be very relevant to what I was um, talking about here or, you know, to what you're experiencing. Okay, another good question is how far off um, is your boat when you're pitching deep weed lines, especially in clear water? You know, that it's kind of tricky. It depends on how, um, I'd say how well you can see them and also how well you can pitch too, because, you know, if you if you can pitch a long ways and you could stay back 20, 30 feet, you know, I would definitely do that. Um, but if, if not, you know, you're just going to get as close as you can, you know, and, and typically those fish in, in clear water when they're, when they're down 10, 15 feet, you know, if they're buried into the grass and you pitch it just right and it falls right down below beside those weed lines, you know, they'll come out and get it. You know, they, they might not be as boat shy as you think because they're usually buried into the, the edge of the grass or cruising the, the weed lines. So it's just going to depend on how far. Okay, good question. Um, got another one. Do you swim the jigs and crankbaits through the grass as well, or just along the edge? Um, you know, I, I do use a swim jig. Um, typically, I use it a lot more during the spring, um, but it, this an actual swim jig is a good choice during the summer as well. Um, but typically, when I'm talking about jigs and grass, I'm going to be pitching to the edge of them with a, a standard casting jig or a pitching jig, like an Arky style. You know, with crankbaits, you know, if you have a certain depth and your, your crankbait dives to just above the grass, you know, that's ideal because getting it through the grass obviously is going to get tangled up too much. So if the grass, if you're in, here's an example, say it's 10 feet deep and the grass comes up two feet and you got a fish that a crankbait that dies about eight feet, you know, that's going to be a good choice because it's the deepest, deepest it's going to get is going to be just above that grass. So that's kind of what I would um, say on that. Good question. Okay. And again, guys, just keep uh, keep sending them. We'll take another little break here in a minute and, and uh, get those questions answered. Okay. Okay. Shallow in the morning, like I was saying, this is kind of my approach in the in the the morning is go as shallow as you can because that often is the the time when they're going to be feeding. You know, they're or they're feeding at night, which we'll talk about night fishing in a minute. But they're still going to be hanging around shallow in the morning. So top water is, is a great choice. And you'll notice I, I mentioned top water quite a bit because I think that's besides drop shot is probably the most important thing to use and crankbaits. I mean, in the, the summer, I mean, those, if I had to pick three rods in the summer in the Northwest, it'd be drop shot rod, crankbait and a top water. Hollow belly swim baits. You know, I talked about those a little bit, you know, and my, my thoughts on size, but that's a great way to catch a big one in the morning. Jigs as well. Senkos and earlier, earlier, the better, you know, that's, you know, they always say early bird gets the worm, you know, this time of year, it's, you got to be on the water, you know, five o'clock at the, you know, it's plenty light then. So the earlier you can get out, the better, especially if you're uh, going to be fishing shallow. Okay. And I'm going to give you an example of a place that I fish quite a bit. So as you can see, this is a, a great option because it has shallow water, deep water, and this area also has a lot of current. So I'll go back real quick. Um, so, you know, typically during the morning, they're going to be up on this, these types of flats, shallow areas, feeding, and then dipped it back down. So this is just one example. And if you, if you notice, you know, there's all these different colors on here. This is um, taken from the Navionics web app. And you could also do this with your graph if you have a Navionics card or the mobile app. And what I've done here is I've changed um, the different colors. So it's adjusting the different um, depth ranges. So certain colors stand out a little bit more. So I found that that's a lot easier for me to find those shallow areas. Um, it's it's very easy to, to do. And if you guys have any questions about that, again, just just shoot me an email or or look it up on YouTube. There's actually some videos on, on that as well. Um, yeah, there's actually one of my videos on there as well. Okay. So shallow in the morning. You know, this is, like I said, it's very shallow. Um, this is a little bit later morning, but, you know, again, they're still going to hit top water. 
around docks and things like that. This is a, a Lucky Craft Sammy. This is one of my one of my top baits as well. Okay, docks is another thing that I always key on in in the the summer. You know, in the there's a lot of ways to fish them. There's a lot of variance between how shallow the docks are. So finding the right dock is, is very important. And I'll show you one thing you can do um, with the help of mapping as well to kind of save you some time. I'll show you that on, I believe it's the next slide. Yeah, it is. Okay, so um, jigs are awesome for docks. You know, pitching the sides of docks, pitching the deep end, skipping under them. There's really no wrong way to fish a jig on, on docks. And I think that'd be my first choice at every dock. You know, same thing with drop shot. You know, you could do a lot with that as well. You know, you could drop shot the deep posts. You know, you could fish them up shallow. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do with drop shot around docks. Um, you know, one thing I, I learned to do, and it's really helped me, is, is learning to skip a bait effectively because they're going to be in the deepest, darkest crevice a lot of times. So a standard cast may not get to those fish. So learning to skip is, is vital. And, you know, you're going to, you know, you're going to backlash, you're going to miss, you're going to hit docks, um, hit boats, things like that. It's just going to take some practice. But I think it's one of the most important things in the summer um, where I live and really anywhere there's docks is to be able to skip. You know, another thing that people don't do as much is, is top water. And you could fish those, um, you could use those shady sides in the middle of the, the hot summer day and if there's a little bit of shade and you could cast right along the dock and then work that top water right where it's a little bit of shade you know you're you'll catch fish on top water you know those fish are up there feeding on bluegill feeding on little bass feeding on trout whatever and you know they're they're looking to eat a lot of times so you know if they're not way in the dark crevice like i was talking about you know top water is a good way to get them um, also crankbaits too you know those deep dock posts you know some of the docks that i fish you know are 20 feet deep and you know, those posts, you know, they're 15 feet, you can crankbait along those as well. And those deep docks, you can fish those all day long. And like I said, I'm gonna show you a quick thing on how you can quickly determine depths of docks um, using mapping. So um, what I'm gonna show you here, this is a, a series of docks on a lake. And you'll notice there's blue area here. This kind of goes back to that shading that I was talking about. And there's no blue area here. So me looking at this, you know, sitting in my basement, I can tell that this area is a lot deeper. These docks are a lot deeper than these docks, just because of there's there's blue. You can see it's four feet, seven feet. You know, there's no depth on this contour, but it's it's going to be. I'm going to say it's ten feet right here uh, on these docks because it's twelve there. Um, so it's it's a great great tool. And and the, these map they, they are one foot con contour intervals. So actually, it's eleven. 10 and it's gonna be a lot deeper than these four and seven. So that's a quick way you can do it. You can mark them on your app and you'll know which ones to target if you're looking for those deep docks. Okay, like I said, I, I was gonna talk about fish care a little bit. You know, the, this time of year fish die because, especially if you're in a tournament, you know, because it's warm temps, you know, in that deep water, you know, you need to take extra care of them. Now, a lot of guys I know that um, they, they always put ice on their fish, you know, in the live well. and I've heard it both ways, but everything that I've, the kind of the, the consensus is that, you know, you, ice is good, but you don't want to put too much in there because you don't want to shock them. If it's, you know, 80 degrees in your live well and you pour a bunch of ice and it's 60 all of a sudden, you could actually do more harm than good. So I'd say just be, uh, don't put too much in there. You know, there's a lot of live well treatments, you know, things like G juice, um, used to be called like O2 or something like that, but it, it's, it's a, it's a good, good way to keep your fish alive. You know, and another thing is, is fizzing fish when you're 20 feet or deeper, you know, with those needles, you know, and I kind of found myself not using them as much now that I use these flip clips. You just stick these on the, the fin of the fish and it keeps them upright. And um, they, it does, their air bladder um, kind of has a chance to readjust. So those are a great tool and they're really cheap. Okay, we're going to talk about night fishing a little bit too. And it, it's funny because you know, I don't night fish as much as I'd like to, you know, but I was just thinking about this, preparing this presentation and I've fished um, six night tournaments in my life and every single one of them I've, I've got to check. So, you know, I'm not saying I'm like a great night fisherman, but the things that I, and I'm going to tell you, they, they work, I guess, because, you know, they, they are producing fish during night tournaments. Um, you know, I, I do change my setting on my Lowrance. This is just the color palette. 
And this is, uh, I believe it's color palette 10. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to see at night. You know, I also turned down my graphs, um, the brightness, because it just gets too blinding. So I, I definitely turn it down quite a bit. Um, and, you know, this is, uh, I got a night tournament coming up too, and I'm really excited about that. So I'll kind of tell you my approach, you know, the baits that I use and things like that. So, you know, night fishing is great because it's so hot during this time of year. And, you know, there's a lot of fish that feed at night when there's so much boat activity. And I know it's kind of going against what I said earlier, but, you know, they're just, they're, they're more in a feeding mode at night during the summer. Um, it's, you're on the water and typically there's not many people out there. Um, so kind of first thing I always say is, is safety first. And, you know, I am very careful at night. You know, I use black lights, headlamps, you know, wear my life vest. Um, I don't drive full speed at night just because I don't want any trouble. I mean, you might be a log floating or anything like that. But, you know, kind of going into, um, you know, more of the fishing side of things. You know, I, I, like, I like to fish shallow during the night time um, because the fish are roaming and looking for, for food. You know, they're, they're going to be up shallow. Those small bluegill and things like that, you know, they don't know what's coming. So it's a lot easier for the uh, a predator fish like bass. So they're going to be all over the place looking for food. You know, and one thing I found fishing at night is it's not as important on exactly like target, like how close you get to a target. If you're casting next to a, a dock, I mean, they could be anywhere around the dock. You don't have to have it a perfect skip or perfect pitch or anything like that. You know, they're going to find the bait. So that that's one nice thing about night fishing is you can, you know, be a little bit, um, you know, you don't have to be the best caster. You know, you might hang up on docks and things like that, but you'll you'll still catch fish even if it's not right next to a dock. Um, you know, one thing I always do is I'm very very um, quiet at night because you know those it is so quiet at night that those fish can hear everything at night. So silence is key. That's something I'm, you know, really honestly, it's something I always am mindful for. You know, I don't drop pliers in the, the middle of the boat. I'm careful when I shut down the lids of, um, you know, my rod lockers and glove box and things like that. But, you know, at night, I'm even more so. But, you know, that's kind of something I've uh, always thought, you know, you just don't want to let the fish know you're there, especially at night. So going into bait selection, here we go again, top water. You know, that's one, it's the most fun, I think, at night because it's, you know, you hear that splash and you don't know how big the fish is, where it is. I mean, there's, it's just awesome when they, they hit something at night. Uh, the other one of my um, favorite night fishing baits is a chatterbait. Um, it just works great just because it has so much vibration. You know, big worms, big jigs, you know, you could use all braid too if you want. I mean, you don't really have to be, the fish aren't gonna be too line shy at night. Um, so those, those big baits are, are great. And this is actually one time that I'll actually use monofilament. You know, typically I'm going to use braid, like I was just talking about, or fluorocarbon. But there is a place for um, just straight monofilament during the night. Um, and I think it's the biggest reason is it's easy to see if you have a black light. I mean, it, it just glows. I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried that before, but try it sometime. You know, have a black light and some, you know, clear blue mono or, or something like that. And it just stands out. So it's a lot easier to detect those bites. Um, you know, also spinner baits. You know, this is a spinner bait that I use at night. This one right here, um, I actually just got this one, but um, it's a very similar to what I use. It's a all black, the big giant Colorado blade, and this is just going to have a lot more action, a lot more vibration at night. Um, this is actually a three quarter ounce too, so I mean, it's going to be a going to be a big thumping bait. Excited about that one. And all black. You know, you you think it kind of goes against what you know people think. You know, or what what you would think maybe that it's so dark that you want something that is a little bit lighter for them to to see, but that black silhouette works great. You know, to for them to be able to to find it. You know, one of my other baits that's not mentioned here that I've done really well on at night is a wacky rig, and uh, just all black senko, and it just falls and something about it up against the the moonlight. It's it's one of the best baits at night in my opinion. But along with all these, these are all top producers for me. Okay, well, it looks like we kind of breezed through it a little bit. So, um, you know, like I said, this is actually my last webinar of the season. I've had six, so I thank you guys for um, attending my other ones. Um, we're getting into the, the Q&A in just a second. Um, but these are some ways to uh, get a hold of me afterwards. Like I said, that's my email. You can also uh, reach me on my Facebook page, um, at Twitter, Instagram. I mean, you guys can see it. You can read. 
Um, so any of those are, are good ways to get all of me and I'd love to hear your, your feedback and get some more specifics. Um, if you have specific questions, I'll be, be sure to answer them. We'll see if we got any questions. Okay, none yet. You guys are uh, not quiet tonight, but it's fine. If, like I said, if you guys have any questions afterwards, I'd be happy to answer them. So make sure I didn't miss any of them. Good. I thought you guys were all going to have. Um... Oh, here you go. Oh, yeah. Good question, Neil. Um, what color big worms at night and you know still black if you're dragging on the bottom yeah still i still use all black even though that the one of the, the benefits of black against the, the moonlight is, is that silhouette but still something black or something very dark like a june bug you know i still found that that is is the best even jigs all black i mean it just seems to do, do so much better at night um but definitely if you haven't night fished much it's it's an awesome way to you know, beat the heat if it's that hot or to just get out there and, um, you know, just try something different. It's, it's a lot of fun. Okay. All right, guys, give it another minute or so, but like I said, I appreciate all you guys for uh, taking time out of your, your evening. Okay, cool. I've got some more questions. Okay, um, Jim, um, do you, he asks, um, do you use a ball bearing swivel or pivoting type drop shot hook? And the answer, I don't use either of those. Um, the swivel is, you know, something a lot of people use to prevent line twist. And I I found that it actually, um, just by using braid with a fluorocarbon leader, um, you're going to reduce a lot of those, uh, that line twist already. So you don't really have to worry about it as, as much. Um, now with the hook question, I, I don't use any of the pivoting type. I just use a, uh, I use two different types of hooks for drop shot. I, if I'm nose hooking, it's going to be a Gamagatsu split shot drop shot hook in a size one almost all the time. And if I'm Texas rigging it, it's a Gamagatsu um, G lock hook. And that's when I'm actually going to Texas rig the worm. Let's see if I have any on my, my table over there. Um, that's what I'm going to use. And that's also in a size one as well. Okay, um, I'm fishing a 50 acre shallow water uh, grass lake. Okay, um, watched your webinar and caught a few small fish for the robo worm um, and a wacky rig Senko. What would you do from there? You know, um, I would, if you're catching just small fish, you know, it could be either the location, could be the lake. Um, you know, maybe there's just not a lot of big ones in there, but maybe try a bigger bait. You know, maybe try a, a six inch robo worm if you were using the smaller one. Um, you could even try a seven inch and, and wacky rig that, try that as well. That's a, a good way to catch a big one. Um, or either, even their, their fat robos, that's another one that I use quite a bit. And that, that does seem to catch fatter or bigger fish sometimes. Oh, okay. Good question about Shasta. And, uh, how can you specific, specifically target largemouth in a lake where they're the dominant species? You know, and that's a, a a question that could apply to a lot of lakes up here, you know, where smallmouth are the dominant species, um, like Long Lake here at where I live, you know, smallmouth are by far the dominant species. But if you're targeting largemouth, um, it's it's can be challenging, honestly. Like I fished Shasta, um, I I probably fished it about ten days, and I don't know if I've ever caught a largemouth there. So there's there's really just not a lot in there, um, you know. But anytime you have flooding or anything like that, where you know, you can get up shallow in the, in the bushes or, you know, I know there's not a lot of bushes there because it draws down so much, but any, anything like that where you can get up shallow and, and pitch, um, I think is probably your best bet, but that's a tough question. You know, like I said, it's kind of like a lake that I fish quite a bit where smallmouth are the dominant species, you know, just being shallow and where the largemouth are going to be is, is really your best, your best bet there, I think. Okay. Okay, um, kind of follow up to the question I just asked um, or answered before about the shallow lake. Um, and he said he caught a few fish and he's in Florida. So to answer your question, you know, that again, I would, you go even bigger in Florida. I mean, you could use a 10 inch worm. You could try that drop shot fishing. It sounds crazy, but you know, in Florida, they're, they're used to eating big things. You know, I've caught 10 inch bass on 10 inch worms. 
but you know you also catch a lot of big ones as well so so give that a shot you know upsize everything you know and that might might be your your key there yeah this is a good question about night fishing you know does it after fishing at dark does it take a while to get going after the initial evening bite yes definitely i found that there's almost always like a dead period you know the you know if it gets dark at nine o'clock you know you might not catch another one till 11 o'clock it's it's like they're full from that that evening bite so there is i found that to happen just about every time i fish tonight there are a lot of lulls especially right after it gets dark i mean i'm not saying that's always the case but i've, I've seen it i think every single time i fished at night so um it yeah like i said it's either they're they're full or they just yeah, I, don't, I don't know exactly what it is but it does seem to be that maybe they're eyes are adjusting or I have no idea. I mean, it's, it's, it does happen though. So, but then there's, there's flurries that, you know, it might be midnight and all of a sudden they just turn on and they will bite like crazy for an hour or two. So it's, it's definitely an interesting uh, dynamic at night, but I, I have seen that and I, I do agree. Okay. Thanks, Neil. Thanks for, thanks for attending. Okay. Well, we're going to uh, get, get off of here, but we will be um, again, putting this on uh, YouTube so you guys can, check it out later. And again, if you have any questions, just, just let me know.